I think we will attempt to start on time in the hope that that will help us to finish on time. Um, I'm, uh, we were all slightly daunted by the title of the session that we are presenting to you today, uh, The Place of OED in Education and Public Life. We, we felt it was challenging and relevant, but terrifyingly broad. Luckily, we have a panel who are challenging, <laughs> relevant, <laughs> and maybe a little broader after that lunch, but certainly broad in the range of their expertise to help us address the, uh, the challenges. So Colin McCabe perhaps needs a little introduction as a writer and film producer, and he is a distinguished professor of English and film at the University of Pix Pittsburgh. James McCracken is a former editor of the OED and uh, played a central role in the data engineering and design for the 2010 redevelopment of OED Online. Um, Julie Blake and Jim Shortis have developed many acclaimed teaching resources in collaboration with the OED, um, including teaching designs for A-level English students. And Tim, I believe, developed the Texts in Context website with the British Library. Julie's uh, handbook of teaching materials, the full English, is apparently duly owned by one in six secondary English teachers, statistically, I believe. And our respondent, Linda, Muggle, Linda Muggleston, sorry, Linda, who I think is known to many of you, Professor of History of English at the University of Oxford here, um, and a Fellow of Pembroke College, and, and her short history of the uh, Oxford History of English is, is available outside. And the, the question we're all, I suppose, struggling with is, is what would the OED look like as a genuinely public project for the 21st century? Uh, we will come to you for your ideas, but for the first hour or so, I invite you to listen to our panel address that question in their various ways. Colin, over to you. Uh, it's a great honour for me to be speaking at this event. In my mid-twenties, when I think one's intellectual powers are at their most intense, I had the great good fortune to lecture on the history of modern and early modern English. For three years, the OED was my constant companion. Indeed, at the end of that three years, I calculated that I spent three months solid reading the Great Dictionary. As a work of scholarship and of intellectual energy, I simply do not know its equal. Every time I think I could not be more impressed, I consult it afresh, and I find my admiration still has room to grow. To be invited to a seminar to discuss its future is a signal honour. However, I am neither a corpus linguist nor a lexicographer, and I'm simply unqualified to speak on the truly amazing pos possibilities, both in terms of evidence and representation, that has been opened up by the digital technologies. I have, however, been part of a small group which has been engaged for nearly 10 years on the updating of a much smaller dictionary, which is itself a product of the OED, and it is because of that project that I am here. I assume that everybody here has some familiarity with Raymond Williams's key words, but in the current context, it's worth rehearsing both its origins and its content. Williams returned to England in 1945, having fought in a tank regiment from Normandy to the Kiel Canal. After completing his English degree in Cambridge, he became a tutor in adult education for Oxford on the south coast of England. Raymond had been a communist at the beginning of the war, and if he left the party, he remained firmly rooted in that intellectual tradition, but he was also, from his time at Cambridge, a Leversite. The Stalinist orthodoxy of the time read culture as a mirror effect of the relations of production. Levis argued for culture as the determining feature of society. Williams had been wrestling with these contradictions and reading in the great social thinkers of the 19th century when almost by chance he looked up culture in the OED in a public library. It was a defining moment, quote, it was like a shock of recognition. The changes of sense I had been trying to understand had begun in English in the early 19th century. The connections I had sensed with class and art, with industry and democracy, took on in the language not only an intellectual, but a historical shape. From that moment, William started writing short essays on these key words and collecting more examples to illustrate the changing and contradictory senses. The original plan was to attach this word list as an appendix to the book that became Culture and Society, but the publisher said there was not enough space, and it was 20 years later in 1976 
that Williams was to publish key words with a second edition and some added entries in 1983. In 2005, a group of us convened to consider updating keywords. We were motivated by two different considerations. On the one hand, we wanted to determine whether Raymond's text needed updating, and on the other, we wondered to what extent the technological advances that provided both databases and the ways of searching them could be used to develop Raymond's achievement. We always had in mind Raymond's task in reading through all of Hume to find every use that Hume had made of the word society, a task that in the early 50s took three months and that could now be accomplished in seconds. We soon found that keywords did need updating, and that for two reasons. The first was that it became very clear that Raymond's book was substantially a book of the 1950s, and therefore already 50 and not 30 years out of date. There were a host of words that Raymond had not considered, which attempted to capture new social phenomena, for example, global, terrorism, celebrity, and another series where political and social developments had invested much older words with newer meanings, faith, corporate, conservative. Secondly, the collapse of Soviet Russia and its Eastern Europe, European satellites had rendered a whole political vocabulary archaic. Words like bourgeois and alienation, so key to my intellectual life as a student, seem to have no currency whatsoever in contemporary debate. Since 2009, the Keywords Project, backed by the University of Pittsburgh and Jesus College Cambridge, has begun the task of producing 100 new keyword entries. 30 of these words can be found now on the Keywords Project website at keywords.pit.edu, and by July 2016, there will be 100 entries, which we hope will also find book form. There will also be a more theoretical work produced in cooperation with the OED, which will look at the way in which the new methods of searching corpora can be combined with Raymond's concern to track keywords through social and political argument. In most of Raymond's entries, and in most of our new keywords, the OED entry serves as the basis for elaborating the social and political debates that play out across a word mean meanings. However, to demonstrate the kind of work and the kind of problems that are involved, I'm going to take as my example today the OED entry for modernism. You should have it on your handouts in front of you, and uh, it's going to be scrolled down as I talk. I take it as an example, for it is a very rare case in which the OED misses what seems to me the dominant sense of the word, which I would define tentatively as literary movement emerging after the First World War, which foregrounds the process of writing. It is this sense which has been a regular part of any de English degree course in the Anglophone world for the last half century. Indeed, it is not only a school, but a period, the period that follows the Victorians. It is true that both the fourth and the first entries in the OED do very generally cover this sense that I am isolating, but I think that many would agree with me that this sense should be both better defined and more prominent than in the current entry. Of one thing, I think we can be certain. On the rare occasion when the great dictionary stumbles, it is not through inattention or incompetence, but through real objective difficulty. Modernism sports two. The first is that it is one of those words, and this is a topic to which I shall return, which needs to be tracked across a variety of European languages. Most importantly, modernismo figures as an important term in Hispanic culture and it gathers at least some of the senses that I've suggested is the dominant one in co contemporary English. It is first unfurled as a term, not in one of the great metropolitan cities of Europe, but far on the periphery in Nicaragua in the 1890s, where it is primarily associated with the name of Ruben D Dario. It was, however, a term which developed a real intellectual life in both Latin America and Spain, and it is at least in part in reaction to this that we have the third sense referred to in the OED, the use of the term by Pius X in a papal encyclical of 1907, which condemns modernism as, quote, the synthesis of all heresies, end quote. This history, for which a non-Hispanist is entirely second-hand, 
needs to be complemented by French uses of the word, which go back much far further than the English to Baudelaire and his call to be defiantly modern. But this is a minor problem, this relation to the European tradition, when compared with the second lexicographical problem of modernism, which is that while uses of the word are relatively plentiful, dating back as far as Swift, the particular sense which I have defined and which is dominant within the university teaching of English occurs relatively late, more than 30 years after the movement it names. Ezra Pound comments on this strange linguistic fact, writing in 1934 and talking of Eliot's arrival in London, he says he participated in a movement to which no name has ever been given, close quote. It was indeed another quarter of a century before the movement received a name, and when it did came, it came in three different traditions. In 1957, George Lukacs's The Meaning of Contemporary Realism was translated into English. Its central opposition is between realism and modernism, where modernism is understood in the sense I am defining, albeit with a heavy negative valency. In the same year, Frank Commode published The Romantic Image, in which modernism, in the sense I have defined, is used systematically as a way of periodizing the recent past. Three years later, Clement Greenberg published his famous essay, Modernist Painting, which, while treating art rather than literature, focused on the art's work's attention to the means of representation rather than representation. As if overnight, the sense I've described became dominant. Certainly that was my experience when I began undergraduate st studies in 1967, although my understanding of the recent nature of that dominance has had to wait another 45 years. It should be said that an engram analysis of modernism and modernist seems to confirm this analysis with considerable greater frequency after 1960, building to a dramatic increase after 1970 right up to the present day. My aim here is not to offer a definitive new sense for modernism, still less a keyword entry on the subject. What I do hope I have demonstrated very briefly is a category of word which requires much greater contextualization, both if we are to get the senses right and also to understand how these senses function. That is to say there is a space of meaning where philology must, of necessity, engage with social and cultural history. That is indeed the space of key words, and if when it was published, it seemed a minor part of William's vast work, I suspect that in time it will come to seem his most important intellectual co contribution. I should say that for the three years when the OED was permanently open on my desk, key words was per permanently open in my hand, and returning to it constantly in the last two, 10 years, I find that like the OED, my admiration for its achievement never ceases to grow. But is this social and political contextualization part of the task of the OED? I want to advance one very strong argument that it is not. If we accept that theoretically there are assumptions that we cannot make explicit, we can, however, practically try to aim off for our own prejudices. And at this practical level, William's ability to cover a range of positions is impressive. There can be few radicals who have been so sympathetic to the contours of conservative thought. But if Williams' method is admirably even-handed, the selection of the corpus is consciously partisan. William is, Williams is very direct about this, stating that the significance is in the selection and refusing the title of dictionary for his work and opting instead for an a vocabulary. One may argue how the OED constitutes its corpus, but its aim is to be comprehensive, and the arguments are always are about what rubrics are to define that comprehensiveness, never about individual words. The selection of a key words vocabulary is always individual and thus explicitly ideological. It should be noted that the current key words um, uh, uh, project has not yet managed to grapple theoretically with these principles of selection, and as the project nears its end and a definitive word list, I anticipate that it may confront real contradictions and disagreements. It is difficult and potentially dangerous for the OED to engage in such choices at an official level. Philip D Durkin's participation in the project as an individual is central to its success, and the encouragement we received is both welcome and important, but any more official participation would be an unjustified risk. 
There is, and I'm about to finish, another powerful argument that as the OED contemplates its future would speak for official en engagement. You may notice that in my brief discussion of modernism, I made no reference to the key words entry. That is because there isn't one, although there is a very brief entry for modern. At one level, this is not surprising. I've already argued that key words is fundamentally a work of the early 1950s, and also argued that the dominant sense of modernism is not yet current at that time. However, to understand why Raymond did not include it, either when he preferred his notes for publication in 1976 or later, one has to consider the very long and intricate entry from realism. For even more strikingly, there is no reference to modernism there. Indeed, in what is undoubtedly the most personal entry in the whole book, it becomes clear that Wils William's commitment to realism is so fundamental that it is impossible to engage properly with, properly with this word. However, the entry on real realism suffers from another weakness germane to our discussion today. Williams wants to argue strongly for a fundamental ambivalence in the term. The most important sense for Williams is one that adds to fictive representations of reality a political edge in which the accurate depiction of social reality can lead to a transformation of that reality. But this aesthetic reaction to romanticism is mirrored by a conservative political reaction in which realism indicates the underlying constraints on the surface froth of politics. Williams um, analysis never mentions either realpolitik, which is the loan word from German which best summarizes this conservative position, nor the fact that according to the OED, realism itself is not derived from real or reality, but is also a loan word from German. Here, and one could offer a myriad of fur further examples, which we have fleetingly glimpsed with Spanish and French in modernism, is that we can see that key words is damagingly monolingual. Williams is very clear about this is in his introduction, and this re I really am about to finish. Quote, many of the most important words I have worked on either developed key meanings in languages other than English or went through a complicated and interactive development in a number of langu major languages, close quotes. And he goes on to say that such analysis is crucially important, not just as philology, but as a central matter of intellectual clarity. And Williams is clear about the difficulty. Um, uh, to do such comparative studies adequately would be an extraordinary international collaborative enterprise, and the difficulty of that may seem sufficient excuse. I would argue that only the OED would be capable of mounting such an enterprise, and I would argue that whatever the difficulties, including those set sketched in my previous argument, it should consider such a European project. In his stimulating contribution to the newsletter, Rick Charkin said, why English? And his question seems a very good one. Here is one specific area where it makes obvious intellectual and institutional sense for the OED to be the major force in providing a European vocabulary. Thank you. Um, I'm really going to talk sort of at the opposite end of the telescope from what Colin has been talking about. Um, because rather than talking about individual words, uh, what I want to suggest today is that um, for all its complexity, the OED is very susceptible to uh, quantified analysis, um, and that this can reveal some very high-level features about the history of English, um, and that this gives opportunities for new ways to engage with the OED. So um, for most of its history, the OED was really just a very long series of uh, separate dictionary entries, and the way you engage with it was just to sit down and read the damn thing. Um, and yet today, sort of from a certain perspective out there in the world, um, the idea of actually reading the OED is, is, is a bit of a stunt. It's something you might do to get a book deal, but probably not under any other circumstances. And yet we're still quite um, tied to this idea that the OED exists really to be carefully read one entry at a time. And there are some very good reasons for this. Um, firstly, lexicographers are very conscious of OED entries as these sort of carefully uh, composed um, accounts and explanations, not just as arrays of information to be cherry-picked. Secondly, um, we're all aware of OED entries as these sort of bristling thickets of um, uncertainty and qualification uh, and exception. So, 
readers need to spend all their time down kind of in the depths of that in order to get the full picture. Um, and thirdly, there's this fear that when you start to move up from that sort of ground level view, um, what you're seeing may just expose the editorial biases of the um, OED rather than saying anything useful about the history of the language. And clearly there's some justification to all of these concerns. But at the same time, there's some really valuable stuff that you miss out on by staying down at that, um, at that sort of entry level. And so what I'm interested in are the pictures that emerge when you examine the OED as a whole. And two things in particular have made this more viable in recent years. Um, the first is high quality frequency data, um, which lets us map the OED in quantitative terms. And the second is the historical thesaurus, which lets us map the OED in semantic terms. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about frequency, but um, we'll come on to the thesaurus if I have time. So the important thing about frequency data is that um, if you don't take word frequency into account, um, then the overview of the OED is going to be skewed by the sort of very long tail of extremely obscure words. Uh, I once calculated that about half of what's in the OED accounts for something like less than a tenth of a percent of a modern English corpus. Um, so any time you try and uh, quantify features of the language by just counting what's in the OED, um, you run into the problem that the dictionary is hugely skewed relative to the language that it documents. So around the end of the last year, I spent some time uh, working with the Google Books Engrams data, which was discussed in some detail this, this morning, um, in order to enhance every OED entry and sub-entry with uh, measures of frequency over time. So this is the example for uh, the verb score. Um, and you can see the individual data points are frequencies over time for um, the various inflections of the verb score. And if there were any significant um, variant spellings and so on, those will also be taken into account. And that gives us an overall frequency uh, for the verb, um, which is the kind of shaded area there. And we can also see at the bottom where score sits in the, um, in the kind of ranking of, of OED entries. Um, so this is the kind of long tail of very obscure entries. And this is, a, this is logarithmic, so obviously that's a kind of much longer and flatter tail than that suggests. Um, so clearly score, which you might think of as being a kind of middle ranking verb, you know, from the OED's point of view, it's a superstar, it's, it's one of the bigger entries. Um, so having done this for every entry and sub-entry in the OED, I mean, some of these are very interesting in themselves. I mean, this example, I think, you know, we can see the rise of the verb score pretty much tied to the emergence of organized sport in the late 1800s and, and so on. There's, there's kind of lots of interesting ways you can read these in relation to particular entries. But today what I'm interested in talking about is um, how frequency information lets us play with the OED on a larger scale. Um, so if we take two bits of information from the OED, um, how words came into the language uh, and when they came into the language, so essentially etymology, first dates, combine that with frequency information, um, we can get a large scale picture of how English has evolved over time. Um, Okay, so this is giving us a picture of um, OED entries as they come into the language, um, where they come from, uh, and the relative significance they have. So that's drawing on the frequency data. So we can see that from um, through about 1100, most of what's coming into English is Germanic. So that's the blue uh, dots that are appearing there. Around 1200, we see quite a marked shift from Germanic to uh, French. So that's the red that's appearing there. Um, and then as we travel through in time, it starts to see a little bit more coming in from, from Latin directly into English. Um, French kind of remains very dominant through this period. And then as we get into kind of 1400s, we start to see um, kind of more coming in from Romance languages generally, so kind of French but also Spanish, um, Italian, still some Germanic appearing, but relatively low frequency words by this point. And then in the 1500s, we start seeing 
English drawing more, more, uh, more on global language. So you start to see things appearing from the Far East, the Indian subcontinent. Um, few are starting to come in from the Americas, Amerindian languages. Getting further and further into the Far East, Japan starts appearing around this, this time as a, as a kind of source of English words. Uh, African languages, Bantu. Um, and then sort of around the 1700s, uh, it kind of goes nuts. We just start drawing from, from, from languages all over the place, um, Australia, New Zealand, Tahiti, Hawaii, um, loads from Indian, Indian subcontinent around this period, much more coming in from African languages. Um, but also, you know, continually dominated by uh, Romance, Latin, uh, and so on through this period. So this is kind of the, this is sort of the high level view of the OED in, in kind of two minutes, kind of where it's showing where it comes from. Um, ending with Chav and Tamagotchi in 1999, which the sort of John Gray pessimist in me kind of sees as a great summary of pre-millennial tension <laughs> where you've come to. Could you go back? So it's kind of good fun and quite a nice sort of summary of the OED. Um, but we can do more with that. We can kind of aggregate all that information and say, okay, we know when words came into the language, where they came from, broadly speaking, um, and uh, what their frequency was, so how much they contributed to the overall corpus of modern English. And we can kind of aggregate that all into a, into a single chart, which is what we've done here. So this is um, time on the x-axis and then uh, the proportion of a modern corpus that's covered on the y-axis. So over here, that's kind of what a modern corpus looks like in terms of how it's made up of words from, from, from different sources. So again, blue, Germanic, uh, purple, I don't know if that looks purple on this screen, uh, Latin, red, romance, green, which wasn't shown in that animation, is words that are uh, kind of formed within English, so compound, compound words all together and so on. Um, but back here, we can see that um, around about the year 1000, pretty much half of a modern corpus was already present in English. Um, and it was almost all Germanic at that point. Very kind of trace element of Latin there. Um, and then around 1200, something very interesting happens, which is that really Germanic ceases to be a significant contributor to the English language. It pretty much flatlines. And obviously, English is continuing to borrow words from German and Swedish and Norwegian and so on. But they're very low frequency words by this point. So it, it doesn't make a great deal of difference. And what happens is that uh, French and then subsequently other Romance languages take over, and that's what, that's what really contributes to the growth of English after that point, and also Latin, and then kind of always compounding in English, of course. Um, and then what of everything else that we saw in that animation, all, those, all the stuff that was coming in from you know, kind of Arabic and uh, the Far East and Japanese and Amerindian languages and so on, um, that make kind of English this sort of great um, mongrel languages, mongrel language. Well, those are all kind of up there, and we can zoom in on that. And Greek is the kind of pale blue, and then yellow is, is effectively everything else. So those are the entries that, although they're very numerous in the dictionary, they're all very low-frequency words, and they contribute very little to the overall corpus of English. Um, But the OD can also tell us more than that. It can tell us, um, it, it can indicate why borrowing happens when it does. Um, so how it's motivated. And that's what we can use the historical thesaurus for. Um, I'm just going to have to skip over that for reasons of time, but i come back to that if anyone's interested. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that the OD data today is very malleable. Um, it embodies descriptions of the history and nature of English as a whole. Um, and of course, this is an emergent <coughs> property. Um, by and large, lexicographers kind of work away one entry at a time without really deliberately trying to engineer a bigger picture. Um, and as I said earlier, frequency information is a sort of necessary corrective that means we can do things that reflect the language rather than just reflecting the OED. But here's the thing that I really want to say. Um, I could talk for hours about all the levels of approximation uh, and normalization and so on that have that underlie this. Almost every data point that I've shown you, you know, could be 
uh, could have some sort of qualification or explanatory notes attached to it. Um, but there's a part of me that feels the OD has always been kind of hamstrung by the need to make those kind of qualifications. And the effect of this is it tends to atomize the OED into a series of um, kind of low-level granular problems and uncertainties. So we get nervous about abstracting um, to, this, to these kind of high-level pictures. And in particular, there's concern about letting anyone else do that. Um, but I think this kind of protectionism has limited the OED's participation in public discourse. So what I'd really like to see is OED metadata made publicly available so that anyone could play with it, splice it with other um, data sets, and come up with their own discoveries and interpretations. Now, of course, there would be concern about exposing the OED as a data set to be played with rather than as uh, sort of carefully composed scholarship. But I don't think those two things are really in conflict. And I draw an analogy with the um, Engram viewer, um, which we heard a lot about um, in sessions this morning. When this was launched in December 2010, um, it was remarkable to see how quickly and enthusiastically it was taken up, sort of for all its faults, and I emphasize that. It was rapidly co-opted uh, into discourse not only about language, but also about um, aspects of culture and history and society. And it's very easy to find examples of the Engram viewer being sort of spectacularly misused or overinterpreted, um, or being used with sort of complete disregard for the caveats and small print. And it's also very easy to find it being used frivolously or childishly. So when someone shows us a chart of tax cuts versus tax increases, the more sober-minded of us might start muttering about corpus composition and the loss of context and the problem of synonyms and all these other kind of problems. Um, Spencer 1933-5 doesn't really care about any, any of that. Um, so loads of people just have fun with this. Um, and to my mind, that's a feature and not a bug. Um, arguments about how the engram viewer should or should not be used or what's driven... Uh, exploration into the nature of the underlying corpus, um, debate about the interpretation of results, um, and as Mark Davis's talk this morning showed, dissatisfaction with the limitations of the Engram viewer have led to a number of alternative third-party applications running on the same data, which is freely licensed. Um, and so in much, way, in much the same way, the release of OED metadata into the wild, I think, would be an invitation to misuse. And I'm sure that some of what would result would be misguided and that small print would be routinely ignored. But again, freedom to do that would be a feature and not a bug. Um, I'm in the privileged position that having once worked for the OED, I'm allowed to kind of carry on playing <laughs> with this data. But I've no doubt that there are thousands of people um, in schools, in universities, in their bedrooms, who would be able to do kind of far more interesting and inventive things with the data than I've shown you today. Thank you. Okay, this is going to be um, a return to uh, low-level granular problems um, and uh, to uh, a kind of uh, interest in scholarship. I say that because I think that um, what we've seen just in the two talks so far has been um, accounts of expert readings using the OED or using OED data. Both of those, uh, both of those kind of approaches actually uh, can be done in schools. I've seen school students work with Raymond Williams Mechanical entry and uh, a small corpus exercise. In fact, we set that for the awarding bodies. And students have started to play with um, corpus linguistics, certainly in, in A-level language. But I think the bigger issue for, uh, for us as teachers is um, in a time where OED in the UK is actually free with free public library access, we're interested to know the level of actual use of the OED, and we're interested to know uh, of the use of the OED in schools and what the pedagogical problem is in inducting, uh, inducting students into such use. So, um, George, you can do this, this quick. Yeah. Uh, so we're at the symposium principally because we have intensive first-hand experience of using OED in secondary school teaching in England. 
and in our roles as educational researchers, designers of learning materials and designers of curriculum and its assessment. Much of this has been focused on upper secondary teaching of um, language variation and change, um, particularly when the UK context there's a post-compulsory education uh, course in um, language study which includes uh, looking at diachronic uh, language change. But the research we've been involved with uh, principally in the ESRC teaching and learning program suggests that these approaches transfer well down the age range. So we have used OED with GCSE students, with lower secondary students and certainly with primary school teachers. In terms of sequencing, this presentation will lay out the landscape of the OED in education as it looks from our vantage point. We'll give you an uh, overview of how the OED has responded to curriculum needs as we've been involved in shaping them over the past 20 years. And we will suggest ways in which OED could build on this work to lead development in the future. We hope to outline the bigger pattern of OED in schools while offering some more intricate pathways for those of you who want to take them. Throughout this presentation, we will emphasize uh, teachers and pupils' practices with OED, um, by which we mean the literacy practice of readers, what learners do or might do with OED, with what purposes, uh, with what effects, rather than what might be, changing, might, might be achieved by changing OED as a text. And we can see that it would be nice to have some kind of corpus facility, to collocations, and there are some good things that could be done to, to the OED, including linking it to a kind of usage dictionary. Um, but actually, what we're suggesting is that uh, as teachers and educators and researchers of education, um, OED might enjoy wider readership and depth of use in formal education settings in schools, even with relatively little uh, change to its current design. However, if bigger changes to OED design are in train, then we suggest really from an argument about the OED in public life, the designers might attend in part to the 500,000 or more uh, school students in any compulsory school year in the UK. I'm just dealing with England at the moment. Obviously, the argument can be extended beyond that or Brit uh, UK now. Um, and uh, also to the 26,000 English teachers, in fact, obviously to the whatever it is, 120,000 teachers in secondary schools. So, uh, and we're saying that this mass audience, this mass and apparently mundane audience, perhaps hasn't uh, featured as much as it um, might have done, and it wouldn't have been feasible for this to have happened until, uh, until uh, people digitised the OED. That's certainly how Julie Blake and I came to use the OED in schools. Um, I can remember using the early CD-ROM just as I started teaching um, and I tracked, uh, I was listening to Joan this morning, I was reminded that we too have tracked every stage in development of the OED and found interesting ways of extending what we're doing with it. So we'll be making the claim for the value of OED in formal uh, educational settings at school level, uh, school level and linking this to the particular value of public scholarship in that environment now. And here, I suppose, we're, tu we're touching on the idea that the big, one of the big social and political economic uh, changes between uh, uh, a nation-state language dictionary in, 19 in late 19th century, early 20th century, and now is the power of markets. Uh, the, uh, the influence of markets, of popular culture, of glo and of globally distributed markets, and the symbiotic relationship between markets or popular culture and vernacular practice. That in other words, if you were to take a kind of Bernstein model of the official discourse being recontextualized in schools, which bring the pupil into those schools to form them into citizens, that becomes more problematic in um, a climate of, of uh, where people are also being formed into consumers in this uh, vernacular culture popular culture relationship. So we're saying there's an ethical reason for OED being used in schools. So we're not making any specific claims about the value in higher education studies, but our work with initial teacher trainees suggests the principles are likely to be transferable. So our sustained interest in OED as educators is based upon a number of beliefs that have emerged out of reflection on the sequence of activities we've developed 
uh, for OED over the, uh, in schools in the past 20 years. These beliefs are predicated on the sense that OED Online is the great work of collaborative scholarship in the humanities. It offers a potential explanation of cultural variation and change that is on a different scale to other language reference sources we know. We, we, know. And we say potential because that potential will be bound up in the practices of readership. We believe that working with OED uh, entries has the potential to change users' understanding of literacy in its extended social and ideological sense. In particular, school students who achieve some working familiarity with OED seem to, uh, seem to gain a way of, uh, of having a better informed tolerance and understanding of linguistic diversity that comes for, than, than comes with the default encounter of schooling. That somehow, if you see the fact of linguistic variation and change as a matter of historical documentary level, even at the granular level of a single word entry, it does, it seems in our experience to change the host, host, hostility of evaluative judgment that, that goes with, uh, with um, uh, schooled literacy. And that's perhaps, perhaps, perhaps part of that audience is primarily that's maybe about teachers rather than students. So the design and the citations appear to open up pupils' sense of temporal scale um, that, and in a way that enables them to place both standard English and contemporary vernaculars in longer and more diverse trajectories. This in turn may liberate younger students from an evaluative default of judging usage as either posh and proper or common, cool or stupid. So we're saying that actually, whatever other reasons there may be for the OED uh, having its historical account, it brings a temporal dimension into the classroom with students who only may have 10 to 15 years of, of experience of literacy over time. We believe that OED use enables pupils to understand the inevitability of social and linguistic change over time and space, and hints at the dynamics of those processes. The data and structure is in place to support such work and school students can respond to its challenge with effective guidance. That evidence gives students a more resilient mental model for understanding the particular pressures they are subject to in the regulative environment of schooled literacy or alternatively in the judgments made about young people and their language choices in news media. So what we're arguing here, and we don't know how much time there'll be to look at it, but we've begun developing heuristics which actually place what we call hyper-standardised um, uh, English, uh, hyper-standardized la language against the context of vernaculars, popular culture, and then the scholarly account over time provided by the OED. We believe that practices in working with OED are timely from a general pedagogic perspective because they foreground the enduring value of public scholarship. It matters that apparently free resources such as dictionary.com promulgate an ethos of just for me need to know convenience juxtaposing lexicographical knowledge and flashing Mazda and Vodafone adverts in a discourse which constructs the, the citizen as consumer. It matters that school students encounter longer standing evidence and more stepped back scholarly perspectives in their encounters with dictionary reference. We believe that the diffusion of digital technology makes it inevitable that students will encounter large data sets and pool of, pools of information that are not designed for novices, but which offer a basis for authentic knowledge building, especially in the context of the more rapid provisional and unstable co-construction of knowledge afforded by digital tools. One of the terms we developed for this uh, when I was working as a researcher in Bristol was that students would come across ungated knowledge pools. They would come across resources like the OED, corpus linguistics, where they wouldn't necessarily have had any induction how to in how to use them. So we're saying that OED use um, provides a way of working with uh, larger data sets in school. OED, even in its present form, is an ideal text to come to understand these social dynamics of literacy and to explore language with small acts of participation in the co-construction of knowledge. And here I'm thinking of uh, John's uh, suggestion about a wiki mantle over OED as offering scope in schools this morning. For us, the pedagogic issue is how to design and enact a different order of engagement at school level in the unusually promising uh, uh, UK context where access is free with public library for subscription. However, as a small coder to that, our efforts in using OED in schools are also shaped and dwarfed by the changes in literacy practices going on outside school gates, and in particular the diffusion of digitally mediated literacy communication. 
For young people in school today, the shifting nature of what counts as literacy in the perpetual contact of conceptually spoken graphical interaction means there is no easy or inevitable progression from the vernaculars of home and street life to the accomplishment of standard language forms. Identity is bound up in unencoded evaluation of choices in a state of literate indeterminacy. This makes the longer and slower temporal scale of OED seem both further removed from young people's perspectives, perspectives and more necessary in providing anchorage and perspective. Okay, what you've got on the, uh, the table is a timeline of things that Tim and I have done, like design experiments in using uh, OED in school. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to leave you to read that in your own time. But um, you'll see, if you look at that, that some of those things have about, been about teaching language change uh, with A-level students. Some of it has been about uh, working with teachers to help them understand the value of the OED. Some of it has been testing designs with primary school. Uh, students. But where we've moved to in the most recent work we've done uh, on the Poetry by Heart timeline is in thinking about uh, link links with the OED that are situated in curriculum uh, activity that students want to do. So I'm going to move quite swiftly forward to how we might lead the development um, in the uh, future. And really what we've got is a number of questions where if the uh, OED wanted to uh, do more work with schools, what, what might the key questions be? I'll just sort of rattle through these and th throw them out there really. So first of all, phonics is a massive public debate and educational debate at the moment. So how might working familiarity with OED shape teacher, pupil and public understanding of the current claims made about sound and spelling correspondence by those espousing synthetic phonics as an all-purpose, all-age te teaching strategy. And that builds on the work that we've done in uh, working with teachers of primary students in understanding etymology and morphology as other strategies. Second, how might a working knowledge of citations and of more re recent entries in OED that focus on digitally medi mediated vernacular uh, develop student, teacher and public understanding of the meta-discursive construction uh, of panic in news media claims about language change or its obverse face of open mouth wonder. And again, that, that builds on work that, that we've done um, in helping students to understand contemporary language change and particularly starting with their own language uh, vernacular. Uh, my third one's disappeared. Um, the third one is how might small selections of OED content, uh, and this refers to what I was just saying about poetry by heart, uh, be mediated differently to provide point of need reference uh, relevant to specific curriculum demands, which will build reading practices that will over time lead to independent use. Because that's, that's the point, is to, uh, is to start with where they are and what they need, but to uh, walk that forwards. And it was interesting in the previous session that people started talking about uh, uh, Microsoft uh, spell checkers because the way that we would uh, uh, most definitely see that is thinking about uh, and linking to what Colin's talking about keywords if you were to take keywords in literacy development of young people and were to think about what kind of software integrated spell checker helped them to understand uh, the, the words they needed to look up or the words they needed to find or curriculum words uh, what might that do uh, for the literacy de development as it relates to the school curriculum and we'll end there Thank you, Linda. If you want to respond to those diverse interventions. Well, I'll have a go. <laughs> so, I'd first of all, I'd like to thank Colin, James, Julie and Tim for these very informed and thought-provoking accounts of the OED and its place in public life and education. There's clearly some great opportunities and challenges, of course, out there. As we can see, I think probably the real key word of the day seems to be digital, really. So using modern technology, availability, accessibility, as all our speakers have made clear, and also this morning as well, is perhaps especially salient. As John Simpson said in one of the symposium posts that one of the big aims for the OED is in fact for it to be um, an icon of the 21st century, not a dinosaur of the 19th. So in terms of really securing this prominence in public discourse um, and education, it seems that not only questions of 
wide, widespread, wide-ranging digital availability are important, but also critically the ability to use to understand what this means in lexicographic terms, what the OED really is and does, being built in from the bottom up. I like Julian Tim's idea that we create this community of a discourse practice and in schools that builds up through uh, pupils' lifetimes, actually. As we've seen across the whole day, in fact, there are quite a lot of really good issues being raised about the OED and um, where it might go in public life. Transparency um, is a word that keeps occurring. The really big question, as James has shown, really, about how you make the invaluable material that OED contains invaluable to more people and across a wider spectrum than maybe currently use it today. Clearly, I mean, it's obvious that innovations, recent innovations on OED website design have made information here much more transparent, much more out there, um, we could say, especially in the way in which timelines, word histories can pre be presented visually as pop-ups and bar charts or whatever, so we can kind of document in very different ways, as well as in the traditional structures of a dictionary which take you through in a rather more prescribed format. So accessibility, including this particular Particularly, I'd like to stress the understanding of what is being um, said to us by an OED entry is clearly a very important aspect to think about. However, um, in preparation for this talk, what I thought I might do um, was, over the past six weeks or so, do an informal survey of dictionaries in the press and public life to see where public discourse is with the OED. So very much on Jones' model. This is very qualitative, not quantitative. But I thought it, was, it did raise some quite interesting issues. In particular, and something OED might like to think about, I have been struck by just how many times over the past few weeks um, I've come across... Ooh, I'm going to go. This doesn't look like me. <laughs> right, here we are. Um, I've come across um, this statement that OED, OED is a historical dictionary, but without any accompanying sense of what this actually means. So, um, repeatedly, we tend to get a lip service paid to this distinctiveness of the OED, OED as keyword, we could say, in effect. Um, yet, historical understanding of this, the idea of the dictionary as an impartial witness to words through time, including in ongoing history, can seem awry. Even in reporting very recently the release of new transfers of the OED, there can still be this very marked tendency, it's again back to this idea about critical engagement with, um, with understanding the OED, a tendency to position the OED as a kind of border guard or a censor rather than as a recorder or a describer, turning into, rather, into something rather similar to Johnson's verdict on the Académie Française in 1755, where it was... It's depicted as guarding the avenues of the language. So to the independent newspaper in June, for example, reported, I quote, language usage running ahead of the standardization that the OED is trying to impose, as in the decision to include the word mouse over in the set of new entries. And in this kind of framing rhetoric, and I have to say the independent was by no means atypical here, new words, new meanings are still being seen as legitimate legitimised by the OED, so a descriptive dictionary keeps being placed into this quasi-prescriptive um, model, while standardisation is given as an explicit aim, which takes us straight back, in fact, here to Trench in 1857, and his comment in trying to pick out new directions for the OED, his comment on the constant confusion in men's minds on this very issue. So I think there are quite a lot of ways where the OED can be given prominent uh, in public discourse, but in ways which can, in fact, already be quite problematic. Um, my informal survey, then, of public comment has, in these terms, turned up some good, but also, predictably, perhaps, some quite disconcerting things. So, on the plus side, to accent the positive, um, if we think about popular culture, 
and public life, we do really seem to live in a period of compelling interest in language. We have blogs, we have particularly the Oxford Words blog, which is you know, very widely used, actually very important. Uh, websites, self-created dictionaries, books on language, etc., etc., all in abundance. So this should mean, of course, that it's relatively easy for the OED to secure a high profile outside academic circles. And it's very clear that the OED often underpins a lot of very good popular writing on language and word history, as in, say, things like Mark Forsyth's um, Etymologicon of 2012, with its very conspicuous interest in word history um, and its promise of a kind of circular stroll through the hidden connections of English. This, like a, many, a number of other popular books on language, takes that same idea of word narratives, which has been used by Michael Prophet and Julian Tim's work, here tracing family trees and lineage and the network of le lexical relationships which history can reveal. Oddly, in spite of the prominence of the digital, um, it's clear that narrative formats, formats of this kind can be really useful in engaging public awareness of what the OED is really telling us, creating a space then where data, and this is the same in the Oxford OUP Words blog actually as well, where it gives us a space where data can be unpicked and given the kind of biographical story of, of birth, life and death, which Trench long ago stressed is particularly important. We could think about the symposium post also by Ursula Lenka, uh, where she said that you know it's words telling their own story, which can for many users be the really compelling bit about the OED, and particularly in its public sense here. And this is one of its key USPs, we could say, and we really shouldn't forget this, I think. Nevertheless, then, I also think, because in spite of all this excitement with digital innovation and what we can all do in the new digital generation, uh, looking at popular comment on the OED and dictionaries, there can still seem to be sometimes a wider rather than a narrower gap emerging between what we, what we can see ordinary users, and particularly media comment, maybe here picking up on Patrick's point earlier, what, what ordinary users and media comment does with the OED, or understand of the OED, as opposed to what language, linguistically informed people can do, as in James's amazing um, technological quantitative display of what you can do with OED data and metadata. So I think here a key issue is, you know, again, in terms of education, is picking what we might term lexicographical literacy or language literacy um, on the model of literacy as revised in OED3, i.e. trying to foster, particularly in education, but maybe also in more wide-ranging ways, the ability to really read a specific domain, here a dictionary, fluently, and to decode appropriately. I do think this is kind of a problem at the minute. In particular, it's something which often seems woefully absent in public comment on language, and specifically public comment on the OED, even by, and this is where it can get quite difficult, even by quite high-profile speakers and writers. So... We might think then of this as a new, another additional desideratum by which the OED could in the future not just foster increased public awareness and response, but also increased informed public engagement and response, actually. So um, I'll give you a quick snapshot here last week in the Daily Mail, which is read by a vast number of people. Um, across the world with a global prominence, you know, so that may be. And we had the OED featuring in the headline, as we can see here. It was all about the changing meaning of the word dictionaries. And this was the headline, Oxford English Dictionary will change the entry for marriage, in inverted commas, to include gay people after same-sex weddings enshrined in law. And it's by someone called Sam Webb. And, um, and so it went on like this, actually. And... Um, as you can see. Um, so it's looking at the OED's own responsiveness to social and cultural shift and the potential of the OED to reflect new meanings as usage changes. However, 
If we then look at the comment side of this, this was then regarded as this, this kind of idea about changing meaning as an artificial perversion of the language to suit political correctness, or that the OED's willingness to change meaning was sounds like something out of 1984, where meaning was going to be controlled by the dictionary. And then we had a whole range of suggestions about, actually, you know, maybe there are other words that, you know, while they're tinkering and, you know, acting as an authority in this particular way, could they maybe also take steps to reduce the word, remove the word heterosexual from the definition and it kind of went on and it got worse and worse and worse so I stopped reading after about 50 posts but it it showed there was a real gap between um, what's being said you know what we might think about the OED you're thinking about us as insiders on, on what it's doing and this kind of public uh, response and particularly when it's in a kind of you know something that has quite a high platform um, in terms of its dissemination. So still more disconcerting, maybe, given what we ass might assume to be um, the kind of high brand recognition of the OED, uh, which I think is undeniable, are these attendant problems, and yet again, understanding precisely what this means. So, for example, the OED, um, this article was illustrated by this, you see, which I, the OED didn't look like this last time I looked at it either on my shelf or on my computer. Um, it's the, the, and likewise, that trope of the OED is a historical dictionary is cited by the Daily Mail, but only to reassure readers that actually it means that the older meanings are still going to be retained, so don't worry, you don't have to use the new one, you see. So there, was, there just seems to be a real problem here. So, so it's both there as being highly visible, but simultaneously maybe being invisible in terms of what it's really doing. So it wasn't the only example I came across where the name of the OED can be repeatedly used as a kind of touchstone of authority. In fact, the Daily Mail also tells us, so it must be true, it is the leading authority on the English language. Yet the nature of that authority and authoritativeness can be confused in public life. So that can give us a very paradoxical position, I think, at the minute, whereby OED's place in public life is similar simultaneously well represented, but is also oddly underrepresented in terms of what it as dictionary seeks to achieve and to do. Um, this split, of course, is nothing new. Okay, we've had a very early example there, Murray in 1884, uh, not from my six-week survey, <laughs> so, but you know, but, so this split between what dictionary makers think they're doing and what dictionary users think they're being told has a long history in itself. And here we have reactions to the very, very first fascicle of the OED. But again, given these opportunities in a digital age for the OED in both education and public life, it strikes me it would be good to ensure that comment on the OED's descriptivism stops somehow being placed in this kind, as I said, quasi-prescriptive lens. So um, at the minute, though, we tend to get things like this. I mean, this is a kind of brief, brief survey. So no, OED is just embarrassing. Oh, it's terrible. It's like your grandmother wearing jeggings. Not in the OED, I oh, know, actually. It's like Yoda trying to sex. Students is an opportunity to wake everyone up, you see, after lunch. Uh, so, you know, and words that deserve to be in the dictionary. I mean, this is, this is, you know, you can parallel this over hundreds of years, actually, but it's still going on in the 21st century. Or, you know, I have to get this in because it's got my favourite quote about John Simpson being related to Homer. So <laughs> this is one of my favourite slides, you see. And this is, uh, yeah, exactly. Is that a coincidence, you know, as they demand? But it's about, again, it's very interesting about this demand for black armbands to be worn in the States. A bizarre, you know, as you put dough in the OED, it was just a bizarre in sense of confusing life with death. So we can keep returning to this truism that all news is good news, but I'm not sure this is quite right. Okay, I will end very, very quickly. Um, the other things we could think about just very briefly are um, certainly one phrase I kept coming across with the OED and reporting of it was, oh, and I turned to the trusty OED or trusty old OED. I'd like to just make a 
get to think very briefly about, is this a good thing? It does this damn with faint praise, actually. Again, I, I wasn't sure this was entirely complimentary. Collins' dictionary, Johnson's dictionary, both also occurred a lot in public discourse on dictionaries over the last six weeks. None of them were trusty or trusty old. Um, we might think then, I mean, you know, that it's positive, it signifies dependability, reliability, you can turn to it without worrying it's going to let you down. But there's also a negative modulation. Um, the connotation's a bit boring. Uh, you know, it's reliable, but it's not cutting edge. And that seemed to be very worrying to me, given the amount that's being invested in making OED cutting edge, actually. So I'm wondering whether there is an opportunity to get better value, really, from this profile that OED wants to achieve in the 21st century. Um, and I will say, just as an offside, that still, I was very surprised to find that historical uses were being documented using not OED. OED's not, we ought to think this should be the obvious point of call. Why is it Collins? I guess it's back to the trope of the day, accessibility, availability. I guess Collins is on the desk. You pick it up. Exactly. But, you know, the idea that you go to Collins to find out what it means in the 18th century. So I do think it, it was surprising to me. Just I, bits where I expected to find more OD were not necessarily there. And I, I think there were some interesting pointers, really. And just this one tiny, tiny quote. I know I'm into time. But, you know, one tiny point was actually um, just to kind of pick up more on Julian Tim's work, actually. I think there is a lot of potential to do that integrating much more at an earlier level so that OED does become your, your first, your automatic place where you go. And I think early education throughout is absolutely vital and although I'd really like to kind of educate Michael Gove a little bit more really about what dictionaries and what language actually does maybe we should take this opportunity to think about integrating kind of coordinated word packs with a massive series of revisions that are about to be launched on um, for example GCSE English in Britain where apparently they have got to do from you know in two years a Shakespeare play romantic poetry late 19th century novel 50 and poetry post 1850 and literature post 1918 and this is 15 and 14 year olds so you know I thought you know can we not unite with like world's classics you've got all these amazing things that are all that already there you've got fantastically informed editors isn't this an opportunity to kind of you know make the best of education reform and really institute OED right from the beginning. There. Okay, I'm stopping now. I really am cutting it. Thank you, Linda, for the tub thumping ending. I just want to quickly, before we go into a 20 minutes discussion, just remind you, since it's been a fairly long session, that we've heard about uh, the OED in public life potentially hosting or facilitating conversations about the words that matter in our culture. We've heard about it potentially opening up to the public, its data, metadata, and research processes. We've heard about how it might engage more fully with pedagogic and emerging knowledge practices of the public. And, of course, we've heard from Linda how the OED enters public discourse, and that might itself be an opportunity to engage more fully in a variety of other um, public and pedagogic discourses as well. So I'm going to open it up to the floor now for your questions to the panel and your contributions. Joan here. Joan, could you wait for the um, mic? Is that okay? Sorry, Thank you. Um, sorry, it's Joan Beale from University of Sheffield. This isn't really a question to the panel. It's really something that's just popped into my head from what Linda was saying. And um, with to do with the media representation of the OED, and, and it's basically, I'm going to have to ask John, uh, Homer's cousin, if he's, if he's here. Um, uh, do you manage the media representation? Do you have a media... Do you have a media team? Um, I mean, for instance, I noticed that, that the, the list of new words always comes out in the silly season. Uh, so um, the journalists pick up on it and they say, oh, isn't it disgusting that the, the OEDs allowed this word in? But to what extent is, is media representation of the OED managed by, by a media team? Um, yeah, we um, we we have a marketing department, and somebody in that marketing department uh, and publicity department is responsible for um, publicity for dictionaries and, and the OED within that. Um, they don't have any um, ability to tell us what to do, but they do put out the press releases, which they check with us um, before they go out. So yeah, there's I mean. The press, the press is a commercial and an educational edu uh, institution, so it's got a, um, um, it's interested in, in 
how it presents its own publicity. Um, I will say on that marriage uh, issue that came up, I mean, there were, there were, it got greyer and, and dirtier all the way down, but actually at the very top... You read further than I <laughs> no, uh, no, I hadn't actually seen those comments before. But uh, at the very top, um, the, they were actually misreading the original response that our, yes. our publicity person yes. sent to them. Yes. So the whole thing was... Uh, I mean, it's just it's, But I've I've tried to train change stereotypes, you know, yeah, uh, over I the know. years, and it, it is it does seem to be really very difficult to well, stop stop education. journalists. You get, yeah. You get them young and, and that critical yeah. reading of what a dictionary is, what you're really being told, I think is really important. We we do find that um, I mean a journalist is asked by his or her ed editor to write a story about this on the OED, and that's the story they're going to write. They talk to us, but that's the story they're going to write, yeah. and that's going to happen um, wherever you are in public life, I guess. Um, I you can always engage with the process of cultural shift. I mean, if you think about reporting of other stereotypes, e.g. racial stereotypes, 50 years ago, we have actually moved on. Certain mm. things that we would, might, write, might have seen yeah. about race 50 years ago, you couldn't possibly say no. I just think there's a time for a more enlightened approach to you know, getting away from the, the gut reaction, prejudice and bias or whatever. Yeah, there's a spectrum yeah. across, the, the, across yeah. the, the, the people who talk to us. Um, but I, I think probably in this case, it, it was, I don't know, sort of, yeah, well, you, I mean, you're right. Daily they're, they're we know what they want to write, but it's quite interesting as it does give that very the prominence, but not it's flagging the OED, but it's not getting mm. you know it's not getting a great profile really for I where you want to go. Actually. But I wonder whatever we did, whatever profile we had, uh, we gave ourselves, that would still be more of a reason almost for some some <laughs> constituencies to to try and knock you over. I mean, it's it, it's, it's difficult to know how to yeah, manage I, that. Yeah, it is. It is. But, but I mean, still, it's, I it's like we, well, the same kind of problem that Oxford University faces often like with our admissions decisions we're damned if we take people from state schools and we're damned if we not you know the kind of thing so but there is that but we the university has increasingly gone towards managing very very active managing what's actually out there in the press actually so mm. i think jane's comment was was very interesting yeah well i think i would just confirm that there is there is a, a quite a large amount of manage, management of, of of what goes out because it's it's uh, it's so important that, that that the right material goes out from our point of view Mm. however it's interpreted once it's there. Maybe we just need to gloss that, okay, what does a historical dictionary mean, you know? So well, they, they just seem to be... I mean, I, I don't think I came across a single article where that comment, that comment kept being included, but actually what the real implications of that just didn't seem to well, work, Well, I think actually. some people at this conference have been using historical dictionary as if it means it's just something to do with the past. Exactly, but it's actually ongoing one level meaning. Of the historical but, you know, that history a, carries on, you know. I mean, maybe yeah. that biographical model, you know, the idea of something life and vitality rather than getting everybody into this negative model of change is really bad or whatever, you know. It's that life-death confusion. <laughs> Sorry, I, I wonder if Tim or uh, Linda had anything to say about the experience of introducing Introducing the OED to young people in a in a pedagogical context and and, and any preconceptions that that you've been able to to, to put to rest, as it were. Well, um, yeah, the sort of work that students do is they as there was, there was um, for their his, uh, historical language change uh, words like gay, uh, where they would take they would do. Uh, linguistic investigation at that point this is before the revision to the OED of gay um, uh, that actually what well what seemed to work best with students with this kind of uh, work with the OED was how you got them beyond being overfaced by it so the activity we used for that which ran in a general further education college with 30 students for five years you know different you know with cohorts of students for five years was that they would use the OED and look up that uh, look up words that had actually changed in their own uh, experience and then they would go to newspaper uh, text databases and sort of sometimes develop their own OED citations but the point was that it was um, by the OED gave them something to focus on something that was historical and something that enabled them to investigate um, uh, their, their kind of newspaper discourse, and that, that, that seemed to work well. I mean, with that, um, that the gay marriage thing, the obvious, the obvious thing to do with that would be to find some other taboos that are, exactly. that are the, from, the, from, from the past and then look at OED evidence, so. Please, over here. Just a quick question for, for Colin. I mean, it's interesting that uh, Williams chose the term keywords when sort of equivalent 
um, dictionaries of glossary of literary terms or concepts. So I wondered whether you could just say something about how you feel the relate, what you feel the, the implications of the the choice of word rather than term or concept or keyword rather than term or concept. Well, I mean, of be. course, the choice has be. I mean, is is rather a difficult one now because if you go and look for keywords now, the the meaning of that is a, 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 a is in reference to computer searching. Um, uh, uh, and, and we have tried to think a bit about whether it's still actually the best word, and I think we just feel there's absolutely no particular point in changing it. As to why he chose that, uh, those words, I actually haven't got a very good, good answer. He, I, I, but I do think the reason he didn't want a glossary is that, above all, he wants the notion of contradiction in the word, Whereas uh, the trouble about something like a glossary, it, it, it presumes that you're somehow exhaustively getting rid of the meanings. Yes. Um, I was thinking there not, not so much the glossary, but the choice of term or concept, which already implies a word that he's... Well, I think because he feels ve very strongly, and I think this is what's really the interest of his work. I mean, he is in that sense a, a genuine philologist. I mean, he really thinks that that's, by getting away from concept or, 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 or term or thing, you're actually looking at the way the material of the language offers the basis for the kind of contradictory meaning. So I think that's, that's, that's the answer to that question. Yeah, please. Uh, I'm Guo Huachen from Beijing Foreign Studies University. And uh, uh, as uh, a user of uh, uh, um, Oxford Dictionaries, I, I use Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary and uh, the OED equally frequently. And uh, I think there is, a, uh, what, there is something that we can do to broaden the impact of the OED because um, OELD has great impact in China. It's the largest selling dictionary, uh, English dictionary in China. Everybody knows it. And, um, but it's a learner's dictionary. Uh, there isn't a teacher's dictionary. I think the OED should fulfill the, uh, the, the role of a teacher's dictionary. And uh, why? Because um, only by learning, by teaching the students uh, the contemporary usage and the meaning of a word is not enough. Uh, recently, uh, our, university, our university press, for, uh, Beijing Foreign, uh, no, uh, Foreign Language and Teaching uh, Research Press, uh, set up a project uh, because translation is becoming a very popular uh, uh, career uh, for uh, English language learners. So they set up a project training students to do translation. And uh, first they have to train the teachers who, who teach translation. And the way they do it is to uh, um, provide them with electronic texts of uh, uh, books and fiction, nonfiction, which are now in public domain, uh, which has no p copyright. But those books were published uh, at least 70, uh, 70 uh, years ago, maybe one century, two centuries ago. And when the teachers translate th those um, uh, uh, texts, they often make uh, mistakes because they, they knew very little about the history of English and how the meaning of words changed. So in this area, I think if we somehow publicize the OED, uh, in uh, not only countries like China, but the whole world. And uh, we can find a big market, uh, the, the teachers of English at both um, uh, middle school level and university lev uh, level. Uh, in this way, I think um, uh, the OED has a, a great fu future to play. Thank you. Um, if I might, I'd just like to go back to James's suggestion and perhaps pick up on some suggestions from the plenary session this morning that there may be ways the OED could enhance its relationship with its users through exposing aspects of its data, its research process, perhaps through new kinds of partnership with other digital providers, with, with uh, providers of lookup tools, with providers of textual analysis and support services, to, 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 to bring more people in to engage with the scholarship and resources of the dictionary in that way. And I think James made quite a provocative uh, suggestion there. And I just wonder, also going back to the plenary session, if people have more to contribute on that side or or want to react to that, either from the dictionary or from, from not?
don't you? I think you want to add? Not to use that venue in schools. Oh. <coughs> um, I, I mean, I suppose the, the kind of relationship I'm thinking of is um, something like the relationship between a Wikipedia article and the sort of info boxes you get at the top right of a, of, of a Wikipedia page. Right. So um, I'm not going to push too hard at the door about actually making the text of the OED public, but I think there's, there's a lot can be done in terms of kind of abstracting the sort of vital statistics um, from the OED um, and making those publicly available as sort of data sets that other people can then can then work with and, and, and do interesting things with. Um, and as I said in the talk, I think there's you know, there's obviously concern about the fact that when you sort of abstract vital statistics, you're losing a lot of the, 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 the kind of detail that goes along with that. But I um, I do think that ultimately that's a way back to the to the text rather than a, a way from it. Um, I, I speak with almost complete ignorance, but I think there's not been a single example of giving away material actually damaging the commercial enterprise. So the, the, the other way around, Encyclopedia Britannica <coughs> actually helped Wikipedia kill them by putting up enough walls and stopping people going. Um, I, I'm sure there are ways. And in, in my experience, for what it's worth, um, I've run quite a few open access type publications in science and in the humanities, and not once could we point to a negative effect which doesn't mean there will always not be a negative effect, but so far, so good. It may mean that the benefits are complex and, and long-term. Yes, but that could well put. Anyone else want to speak as a controversial subject in the back, please? Uh, um, I, I, as I understand it, they, the idea now is you sell eyeballs, rather, than what you're... What you're <laughs> what you want is eyeballs rather than uh, people buying the text and that uh, the fact that they're looking at it is of value in terms of gathering data. That's, that's where the money is. But uh, I, I do know of some research that's recently been done on um, examining the way that people learn from dictionary entries, non-native speakers actually, it was conducted in Poland, uh, where... Um, first of all, it's a series of studies, and the first study um, found, contrary to expectation, that um, students remembered more looking uh, when they looked up. They remembered the words better if they looked them up in electronic format as opposed to on the page, which was a surprise because it's often said that because it's so quick, you know, it's such a quick in-out experience that you won't. It's not pedagogically beneficial to use electronic dictionaries. But then this research was replicated with a number of other dictionaries, all electronic, and the, it couldn't, the results couldn't be replicated. And the conclusion was reached that it was because there was too much noise. On The, the original study was with a dictionary where it was just an empty page with the um, dictionary entry, no adverts, nothing. Uh, just, just the dictionary information in electronic form. Further studies, replication studies, use dictionaries where there were adverts on the page and that immediately seemed to affect understanding and retention. So that's the danger, isn't it? That if, if you go free, if, if, if you off, offer your dictionary content free but make your money through advertising, it could have a detrimental effect on uh, on processing of the information. Well, there are plenty of open models which don't... Well, there are plenty of open, yes, plenty of open models that don't, that sell the eyeballs rather than the uh, advertising space. Yes, or, 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 or That's even worse in a way, yeah, but it doesn't... <laughs> or engage users in other ways to, to bring them yes, into Yes, yes, I mean, they're certainly... Mm. Yeah. I have uh, Patrick Hanks again. I have only two minor interventions, and it's nearly tea time. Um, one is that um, is the old adage that uh, all publicity is good publicity, picking up on Richard Sharkin's point. When the new Oxford Dictionary of English 
was published in 1998, now called, rather confusingly, the Oxford Dictionary of English. Um, um, there was a huge furore in Yorkshire because it contains uh, names of places as well as people, so, like Shakespeare. Um, huge furore because Yorkshire was defined as a former county. Administratively, it is true that Yorkshire is a former county. Did it harm sales in Yorkshire? Not as far as I know. Um, and I wanted to pick up also the point on um, wiction Wiktionary, because I think it needs to be made clear, and Geoffrey Triggs almost said this and the, at the plenary session this morning, but he didn't quite, so I'm going to say it, that unlike Wikipedia, a, a dictionary, to be an effective dictionary, needs an overall John Simpson to provide a guidance to the whole team. It's a team effort, but it's a led team. Um, and so you need one overall intelligence driving the project. And that's one of the problems. You can't do it by crowd crowdsourcing. So I was quite alarmed this morning to hear people proposing that, uh, that, that there should be little OEDs being set up all over the world in different countries. Uh, and ob I, I'm sure we would not allow them to go off on their own, but if we did, we would be making a mistake. Thank you. I don't quite remember that proposal from this morning, but I'm sure it would have been a bad one. Since we've got about four minutes left, um, I'd just like to go back to the panel and ask, I haven't told them, but just if they want to sort of say maybe one or, or briefly two things um, in, in summary, perhaps focusing on the question of what the OED could be doing better or could begin doing or, or go on doing that would allow it to engage more fully in education and public life? I mean, I think the, 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 the thought that, um, that I had from this um, uh, uh, symposium was uh, Richard Charkin's. I mean, that the, the, the dictionary should think very hard about what its relationship is to other languages and that, in fact, there's both cultural and economic advantages to be using that position to, to as it were, broaden uh, uh, its linguistic fields. Um, I can't claim any particular insights into um, education. Um, the thing that always strikes me about the OED is that um, it's as much a, uh, a window onto aspects of culture and history and society as, as language, and I think that's one of the things that fascinates people about it, and I think that's one of the areas that um, that's one of the areas that we could focus on in, in, in terms of, of sort of increasing public interest in and use of the OED. Um, but I think part of that also has to be about making um, the OED more porous in terms of linking with other, with other resources and encyclopedic resources, historical resources and so on to, to, to show what it has to offer in that respect. Yes, I'd, I'd agree certainly on the idea of porosity and transparency. And I think in particular, you know, building on what um, Julie and, and Tim have said, this, this idea of creating communities of practice from the bottom up to create this sort of informed readership of the OED. So we look forward to a very new era in which the OED might be used. Uh, I'd be, we'd be really interested to get correspondence from people, um, I found it difficult to explain what we've been actually been doing. And I think the, the issue is actually pedagog pedagogical design is, diffi is difficult, it is work. I think it's just so important that the OED, as this ungated knowledge pool, attracts a mass readership. And I think it's perfectly possible for it to do that. But I think it will need um, mediation. It was never written to be read by the people who can now read it. Um, but uh, just welcome, welcome correspondence with people about, uh, who, who, um, about uh, the kind of approaches we, we've, we've suggested. Thank you. Um, just to um, fi finish off, um, I th two, two short things. One following what, what Linda said um, about creating this community of people who have the reading practices to use the dictionary and to make, make it meaningful in their, their lives and their, their own literacy practices. I think the one suggestion I would 
immediate suggestion I would have would be to think about how new teachers might be inculcated in, in using it. We train thousands of teachers in this country every year who go into the profession. In my experience, if you get them while they're fresh, uh, they're very receptive and, uh, and practices that they uh, are, are encouraged to use early on tend to stay with them and develop over a career. So that's one thing. And then just the second thing, a practical thing, um, we, we, we skated very, very quickly over some of the things that um, we've done. And if people are interested to look at those, we do have a number of PDFs, which I have been attempting to load up to the Trello board with no success so far. But Alice has promised me uh, she'll help me with those. So if anyone wanted to have a look at some of those designs, you'd be most welcome to. Thank you very much, Julian. Before we thank the panel um, for their contributions, I'm, I'm asked to tell you that this coffee break will be as advertised, and the next session begins at 3.15. The following coffee break will simply be to collect coffee and go to the plenary room so that we can have as much time as possible in the plenary session. So thank you very much to our panel for a very um, challenging, varied, and, and, and wide-ranging session.